because it's such a complex industry and everyone's focusing, tends to focus on different things. So to coalesce around one central point of customer experience, that's the reason we exist, to serve patients and customers the best way we can and maximize their experience. And it, it takes years to get there. It's a hard cultural shift. Hello, healthcare. We're excited to be back on the floor at HMPS 2021. We've been covering themes around digital transformation, patient engagement, patient experience, uh, marketing and outreach and things like that. But there's actually a combination of the two that, that you're, you're starting to hear a lot about. And that's why we're excited to bring in Craig Karchner, who is the AVP of not only marketing, but also consumer experience at Honor Health. Uh, Craig, just a little bit of background on, on what you're doing there today. Well, what we're trying to do is, is improve customer experience at the same time we're working on marketing. They really go hand in hand. Most healthcare companies, in my experience, don't even have a customer experience department, but they have a marketing department. And who is closest to the customer, the end consumer, who understands the consumer best and has done the most research on consumers, usually is the marketing department. So we're trying to bridge that divide between marketing and CX and the rest of the system so that we change. We're not just adding technology to improve CX, but we're trying to change the culture and the processes and the operations in order to maximize customer experience. That's the theory, at least. So you're hearing it from Craig right now. For everybody who's been really excited or uh, really even scared of uh, a lot of the new disruptors that are coming in that are uh, more adept with developing customer experiences, listening to, uh, listening to their customers, and they're taking that same kind of knowledge into healthcare, this, co this combination between the uh, marketing experience and the, and, and the consumer experience is uh, starting to take hold and, and become really important. And it, it, it kind of begs the question. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of marketers might be looking at these experiences but not really feel like there's any kind of input that they have or uh, ability to start making change there. We're starting to see that a lot like with the convergence of the consumer experience and the, and the marketing role, we're starting to see some, some, some change with regards to that. So let's back up a little bit and talk about this, this consumer experience. Craig, could you talk about what the consumer experience actually means at uh, Honor Health? What, what yeah. is that? I'll start with the story. One of my favorite coworkers at Honor Health is the chief patient experience officer. She's a trained OB. She's incredible. I, I love her so much. I want to hang out with her on weekends. She's just, she's cool. She's smart. But we had major conflict when I first came because I kept talking about CX, CX. We need to do this. I want to do this. I want to lead out on this. And she's saying, whoa, who are you? I'm the chief patient experience officer. You know what? You're, you're getting in my territory. And of course, she didn't do it in that hostile manner because she's too <laughs> cool for that. But that, that was her concern, that we were invading her territory. So we really had to sit down, the two of us, and define what is patient experience versus what is customer experience. They are not the same thing. Her focus and the focus of things like HCAPs and CGCAPs, those studies that everyone tends to use, they focus very much on the experience of the patient in the hospital environment or in the clinic environment. Sarah Snell, the chief patient experience officer that I referenced, she does a lot of training for frontline clinicians in the hospital. That's what she focuses on, in specific behaviors they need to do to live up to in order to live, deliver a good patient experience. But customer experience starts long before they come through the threshold of the hospital. It's even when they're considering, they're trying to discover what their ailment is. What is their condition and what type of care do they need? Where do they go for information? And once they find out the information, the type of care they think they need, then what? How do they find the right person to see? How do they judge quality? Or is it by outcomes? Is it by just reviews and reputation? And then how do they schedule? So you can see it's, it's all the different uh, points in their journey from the time they realize they need healthcare until they get the healthcare and beyond. That's customer experience, far broader than just patient experience. And I think just understanding the difference in definition can help uh, a, a health system focus where they need to focus. Now, when we say focus where we need to focus, and, and you've, you've laid out the, this, this broad definition, I'm curious, are there, uh, like, was it, is somebody already owning this, uh, this aspect of the process, or, or do you think that there's a lot there in that scope 
that doesn't even have an owner that, that's getting ignored, ignored in a lot of situations. I would say it's the exception rather than the rule that there is a clear owner. There are very few customer experience departments in my experience. And marketing, I said before, marketing seems to be the natural fit, but even marketing has its purview, its scope. Mm -hmm. So until you involve a multidisciplinary team, you have to have IT, you have to have analytics, you have to have clinical leaders and ops leaders. If you don't get those teams together and working toward the same cause, then you're not gonna succeed in improving customer experience. And that is so hard in healthcare because it's such a complex industry and everyone's focusing, tends to focus on different things. So to coalesce around one central point of customer experience, that's the reason we exist, to serve patients and customers the best way we can and maximize their experience. And it, it takes years to get there. It's a hard cultural shift. I can, I can only imagine that that's a lot of gravity required to bring all those different uh, yeah. parts, uh, parts together. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit coy, like the, uh, the subject of your uh, speech at HMPS was around or is around the, the uh, consumer experience index or customer experience, consumer or customer? Customer. Customer yeah. experience index. So I, I don't know, like intuitively, it, it sounds like there might be some involvement in that gravity. Like if, if we're bringing all these folks together, there has to be something that we can measure against, right? Or could you, could you talk about yeah. the origin of that or, or just even more broadly? what it took to bring all those different parts together. Yeah, and by the way, we're, we're far from completing our journey. We're still very much at the beginning. But mm -hmm. when I first joined Honor Health, I think this is the same way in a lot of healthcare systems. They use HCAPs and CGCAPs to measure customer experience. And it's because those have been developed over years and years, they're mandated to use HCAPs if they're a CMS beneficiary. They have to do a certain number of, of uh, surveys. And so it's logical to look to, to HCAPs and see the CAPS surveys for your customer experience. But the problem is they measure this tiny little sliver of the experience just when you're in the clinic or when you're in the hospital. And there is no composite. It's You have to look question by question by question. There is no like grand total, grand average of your score is this for HCAPs, right? So you have to look question by question which is, it makes it difficult to, it's still useful, mm -hmm. but it makes it difficult to be the one metric to look to and to set goals around for improving customer experience. So we, that's why we put together this proprietary CX index that has four components, because we wanted something that measured not just that tiny sliver when the patient is in the hospital, but before and after, and we wanted something where we could point to one score and say, look, our grand composite average is bam, this and we're setting goals to improve this by 1% per month over the next three years, that sort of thing. So, but again, early on in the journey and mm -hmm. we're not where we wanna be yet. So thank you for uh, sharing, what, what, like share, shedding light on the, uh, on the score, uh, what it was developed for and things like that. I wonder uh, like, how, how is it going or, or, or how, how did you start to get adoption or uh, buy-in or interest in, in that number from, from these different groups? Yeah, it's a good question. We reorganized not too long, about two years ago, and hired a chief transformation officer who is a trained MD. He's a trained doc. And under him, we have all the departments I listed before that need to be involved in improving customer experience. IT, the informatics chief medical and nursing informatics officers and marketing, the project management office, et cetera. There are several other departments under him. And so the governance and accountability is a clear line under one leader. So we didn't have to convince 50 leaders in 19 different committee meetings. It was one leader. Now, that doesn't mean no one else was involved. Of course, many others were involved. But he holds the purse strings and the accountability for a lot of the departments that are working on customer experience. So that helped us enormously. Mm -hmm. And he was able to socialize it with other executives. And because he's a physician, he was able to socialize it even among the clinical staff and get buy-in better and more efficiently than... I would have been able to do on my own or any individual department would have been able to do on its own. That made a huge difference. And it's the, one of the main reasons that the CX index now is one of the board goals. At the board level, it, uh, our goal against the CX index is on that dashboard. So the board, all the way up to the senior leaders and the board are looking at the CX index quarterly as they assess our progress. So it's now that important that it's become at the board level. That highlights a powerful reason as to why you, you need to have that composite score. Because if you have so many def, uh, different variables, different definitions, oh, we got to talk about customer experience. Let's just talk about this aspect or pick this aspect out and cherry pick 
what's going well. But what you're talking about is a scenario where there is a, kind of a, a, a forced look at how this thing changes up and down over time. And you're beholden to that. There's no ability to cherry pick your way out of, out of that. And it, it forces the organization to deal with the real. It, you're spot on. And we still do measure all those individual things that make mm -hmm. up the broader CX index, of course. But you're right. There's no hiding behind it. You can't cherry pick the ones where you're already doing well or you know you're going to make a lot of progress this quarter because of, you know, you're bringing on a new physician who excels at that or whatever. It forces you to focus on the entire experience. You're right. So let's talk about that. Uh, scenarios where there's, there's going to be ups and flows uh, with, the uh, consumer, uh, with the customer experience index. What happens once we see that number go down what, or what, what's happened in the past once we've seen that drop? I wish I could say that we show the data and there is a mad dash to change it and everyone's saying, oh, you know, the, it's dropped a half point. We need mm -hmm. to do something right now. It hasn't been quite that uh, burning platform E. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish it, I wish it were that way, <laughs> but it hasn't been. But because all the way down to our incentive plans that executives are paid against are, are paid in part on achieving all our board goals, including the CX index. So there is a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and importance and a lot of scrutiny. I think that's something that people sometimes forget. Marketing departments, they're always want more credibility, more respect. They want to be at the table. Mm -hmm. and they, should, they should be at the table. But that comes with scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Having a CX index that my department does, controls, or however you want to say that, means that we are scrutinized. If it drops, they look to us. Well, is the technology not working, Craig? Why is, the, why is your website appointment scheduling fulfillment down? You haven't hit your goal. And there's a lot of pressure and scrutiny. So it's an uncomfortable sometimes, but necessary place to be. And it does mean that we can get action quicker, even though it's not exactly burning platform all the time. Mm -hmm. We definitely can get action quicker from the departments that need to act when there is a drop. Because we can say, look, this isn't just a nice to have thing. This is a board level goal. Excellent. And, and it sounds like by having that process where there's ownership, where there is visibility on this, where there's, I, even, uh, I didn't even recognize this part, but incentives tied to this yeah. uh, uh, from a pay perspective, it's not necessarily the burning platform. Uh, and we might want to reserve that for like more immediate and urgent issues anyway. Yeah. But uh, like there, there's actions that are able to be taken. Um, any, any, any examples as, as far as, uh, like we were, we were looking to marketing to, uh, improve the experience on the website or, or just, just any, any stories or examples that, as a result of that, that additional scrutiny. Yeah. So when we first started measuring online scheduling is a big part of improving customer experience, making it easy for people to get appointments when they want that convenes them the right type of appointment at the right time for them. Right. Well, a lot of the focus was on my chart. We're an Epic client. Our patient portal is my chart. And there was a lot, a huge emphasis to push people into my chart to do their scheduling. So we have pretty good numbers in my chart. In fact, against our other, other Epic clients in the country, we compare very favorably, but on our, for guests who don't either don't have a my chart account or don't want to log into their my chart account to set an appointment as a new appointment as a guest, we were, really underperforming. Our website was not built for that. We mm -hmm. tend to, tended to focus on my chart and not enough on the, just the broader digital experience. And so our throughput, if you tried to schedule an appointment from our website without logging into my chart, our throughput was abysmal. We didn't really realize it at first until we started measuring it. And then we realized, wow, that, we are not performing there. And so we started looking into what portions were tech problems. And there were some tech problems the way we surface physician data to make physicians how to find them. When you do your search for a doc, you know, we had to fix some things with the data. We had to fix some things with the technology and certainly had to fix some things with the operations, the back end. how are schedules built. And can we make this slot of appointment visible to guests and to patients in my chart to both. So we, there was a lot of political and operational changes we had to make as well. But the fact that we're measuring it and focusing on it, alerted us to that fact that we needed to make changes. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have known. And so we're now steadily making progress. We're still so far short of where I want to be. Mm -hmm. But 
we're moving in the right direction. Good, good. And I mean, we're ch chasing where the puck is going, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of leads to another question. I, I know that there, there, there's the focus on the scheduling and access component right now, but I'm curious if uh, like opening up the CX index, seeing the ebbs and flows, digging into why, curious about what other uh, consumer experience aspects are just on the radar for you, like just think, things that you're interested in. Yeah, a good question. I mean, it's it's access in terms of scheduling the right right appointment at the right time. Another huge one is choice. It's I find this in in healthcare marketing that everything is cumulative. It's additive. Just because you now can do paid search advertising doesn't mean you no longer do billboards that have been around for two hundred years or whatever. Right? It means you add to it, and it's the same with customer experience options access ways to improve patient access to care. Just because we have telehealth now doesn't mean that in-person primary care visits go away, they don't. So it's about getting a whole bevy of offerings in front of your customers and letting them choose, making it easy for them to find it and then choose the way that works best for them and their schedule and their issue. There are some clinical protocols. You can't do all things remotely. You can't do any type of visit via telehealth. It's just not gonna work. So there are some parameters you have to, clinical protocols and parameters you have to abide by but we can give a lot more choice to customers and let them pick how they want to access. So that's another huge area is adding more tools in more ways. Another huge one is communication. And this one kind of surprised me when we started digging more and more into the research that communication with the care team is as cumbersome and difficult as it is. A huge way that people use, communicate with their care team is, again, using MyChart, the patient portal. And it's a great tool for that, it's secure, and you can get all the way to your doctor or your doctor's staff without, you know exactly who to go to is my point. When you message, it's going to the right person, which is awesome. But on the doctor's side, they are inundated with messages, buried in messages. They can't get to them fast enough, right? I mean, they have these very busy days. And then when they go home at night, they've got to tackle the 179 MyChart messages they have, they have from their patients. So we've really got to find a better way to, for patients to communicate with their care team when they have questions. Some of it's gonna to have to be automated. I think there's huge opportunity for AI. That AI can satisfy and answer a lot of those questions without having to involve a human. Um, and there need to be other solutions. Communication is a big problem. Absolutely, so uh, great way to frame it up too. Um, I'm glad that we're not here to beat up on billboards. They're not, <laughs> yeah, they still, they still serve a purpose. There's a place. Yes, they're definitely a place. Uh, and, but. Like an, an example, like we're, we're just because we're, there's a new technology or a new way of doing things doesn't mean that we should get rid of the old. Right. One good example is like uh, the phone system, for, uh, for example. Like, like there's online scheduling available, but I mean, I'm a millennial personally, but I'm just very inclined to just tap that uh, uh, that phone, uh, click the really? call number and tap zero a bunch of times and just like schedule it not to worry about. Uh, you know, I, I might not have as much faith that, uh, like, that my schedule online might actually go through. So interesting. Just some different tendencies. See, and I wouldn't have predicted that for your generation, for your age category. Exactly. Exactly. Like, like, on average, you could, but we, uh, we we're evolving. Like you mentioned, AI. You, uh, we're, we're evolving beyond averages. There's all kinds of different contexts. True. Yeah. So uh, now it's instead of averages, it's personalization, which uh, having that bevy of options leads to. So, yeah, yeah, super exciting to uh, think about. Here's a, here's another question that I had is um, like in, in looking at this consumer experience index and, and looking at all, all these different factors that that you're measuring. Are there any kind of insights that came out that were unintuitive or uh, j just things that came out about the surprise the, the experience that that surprised you? I just surprised you with like, hey, I'd rather call you on the phone. <laughs> uh, any any other any surprises to come out of it? Yeah, actually, a lot of surprises. One of them was that um, telehealth was not the answer I thought it was. I personally, maybe it's based on my uh, demographics, I expected people to want telehealth now. We want to use virtual <laughs> visits, you know, and this we started this before COVID, by the way, <laughs> so there wasn't quite the drive to do things virtually, but I expected that to be the answer. You know, let us do a telehealth. I don't want to have to drive to the clinic and park and sit in the waiting room with sick people and blah, blah, blah. I just, give me telehealth. And it was like the last on the list. People are not, as, that's not exactly true, halfway down the list when we're researching what is most important to people mm -hmm. to solve CX problems. It wasn't high. 
people didn't, at least at the time, were not as interested in telehealth as I thought they might be. That was shocking to me. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised at the adoption of my chart. There's so many people that have my chart accounts, but don't want to use them. They don't remember their login. They don't want to mess with it. And so they want to be able to do everything they can do in my chart without logging into my chart, you know? <laughs> so it's this struggle because my chart is you put such an investment in your EMR, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars over the lifetime in your EMR. And you want to utilize, if there's a tool they offer, you want to utilize it because it's free. You've already paid for it, right? So it's finding out what people are willing to log into and, and, and enjoy about my chart and it's a good experience versus the things they hate and resist and won't use it for and trying to accommodate both sides. Use this powerful tool that you invested in, but also investing in best in class regardless of whether it's your EMR or not. There were some surprises there too. Interesting, uh, can you tell me more about those surprises? Yeah, so if you think about uh, my chart specifically and some of the tools that it offers, we've found that this is pretty uh, demographic. People don't have a relationship with their physician like they once did. So that, that relationship used to be sacrosanct. You know, you went to the same, your, your dad went to this doc and you go to the same doc, all your siblings go to the same doc. She probably, he or she probably lives in the neighborhood and maybe if you can't pay, you could barter a service instead, right? That's a, the way the relationship used to be a long time ago was that way, family, friend, family, neighborhood doc. And then into the, maybe not neighborhood doc anymore, but at least a very solid relationship, you would never think of going to a different doctor. Mm -hmm. It's not that way anymore. So you'll go to, it's convenience is king. You'll go wherever you can get your script the fastest or get whatever you need solved quick, as quickly and easily as possible. So things like asynchronous care, this was another surprise, sorry, long lead up to get to the surprise. We uh, turned on the Epic, the MyChart asynchronous care. So basically, you fill out a form, and it's not for every service, but there are many services that you can fill out this uh, form and submit it, and within 24 hours, you will get a diagnosis and or treatment plan, right, based on how you filled out that form. And we did exactly nothing to market it. Zero marketing, because we just weren't to that point yet. We were intended to market it, but turned it on and got it all operationally working, and we were amazed at how many people used it. They found it in my chart, used it, loved it, left good reviews, and referred others to use it as well, <laughs> and we literally spent zero on marketing. That surprised me too, that people would, they didn't, the uptake for telehealth wasn't quite as fast, but asynchronous care was. People loved that. So, surprised by that. I love it. I, I, like, I, I, lo I love these surprises that, uh, by starting to look at this, starting to measure it, uh, you find you start ending up finding out why it was not a good idea to rely on uh, preconcept, preconceived notions. Yeah, you know, telehealth. We found in further research. Sorry to interrupt, Chris, but we found that for telehealth video visits, there was intimidation around the platform. Um, not just if it's secure, although that was a concern, but you know, people weren't as accustomed when we were doing this survey two years ago with the, the video portion of it. Well, I don't know if my what system are they using, and will my phone be compatible? And I don't know how the video works. And I look hideous today because I'm sick and I haven't put on my makeup. Do I want someone to see me? And there were all these things that went into it. Whereas, and maybe that's part of the reason we found that's part of the reason that people didn't adopt telehealth as quickly as we thought they might. Whereas asynchronous care, you can do you're, you're at work mm -hmm. and you can do that on the side, right? You don't have to interrupt for an actual video visit. Just fill out this form, and and there's no question about whether your phone or your computer, your platform is going to accommodate it because it's just like a text document, right? Mm -hmm. well, maybe that's why we were surprised by that, but maybe we shouldn't have been surprised by that because like, well, it fit their modality. It fit the way they wanted to operate. Amazing. Yeah. The fact that it was on their time, like yeah. I, I can only imagine just not having to do any kind of uh, scheduling, but just get the information that I, uh, that I need, wait a little bit, and then I'll well, send the information I need, wait a little bit and, and get the information yeah. that I want. Uh, so, I'm thinking that somewhere near 100% of the viewers of this are going to want to get started. I'm wondering what your uh, like what your advice is. Like you know, hearing these surprises, hearing uh, the different insights that have led to strategic shifts and better direction of your investments. But it, like as you, as you uh, outlined uh, uh, early on, starting is hard. The, the the marketer or the director or the VP who's who's watching this. 
what are some steps that, that they can start doing personally to start getting adoption or interest around, the, uh, around this in, in their own organizations? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a key question. I think it's, it's communication and talking and it's multidisciplinary. This probably sounds so obvious, but it really is the, fundamentally the most important thing to do. You need to ultimately build a multidisciplinary team to tackle CX, to implement the technologies, technologies to change the culture, to change the procedures in order to, to improve CX, to focus on that. But you're not gonna get to that structure of an actual CX department, CX team, multidisciplinary team to do that right off the bat. It's not possible. Just start with conversations. And if you're in marketing, like you said, start with conversations with your IT department. What projects are they working on and what drives them? And uh, even specifically around CX, talk to them about your patient portal. What are you working on in, in the patient portal and who's driving it? What clinicians and operations leaders are telling you, asking you what to do and putting in requests? Talk to them. What matters to the clinicians and what's most frustrating to their patients? We did a lot of like human-centered design of really watching, talking with clinicians and watching the way that patients interact with their clinicians and what they do in the waiting room and how the front desk interacts with the patient. Talk to them. They're the ones, talk to the frontline staff. They're the ones who interact with patients on every day, all day, every day. Find out the things they hear, the questions they hear, what frustrates and angers the patients they interact with and so on. That's gonna give you not just a list of pain points and things you know you need to work on and potential solutions, ideas for solutions to solve those problems, but it also, you're already starting to coalesce the team. You're already starting to figure out the people who matter, who are the decision makers, and who understand patients and what, they're, and what the clinicians are going through, you're starting to form that informal team that you can slowly formalize over time once you get that governance process more and more ingrained. That's a great way to look at it. It's not just, it's not just data. It's not just uh, pulling in a bunch of different reports and coalescing them and saying, hey, here's a number. It's a network of relationships that you need to establish to even be able to address and act on the, whatever sc the scores end up being yeah. once you're through that process. Yeah, man, that's the truth. We, it, it, what something you said triggered something in my mind that you have to focus on data relentlessly, measure results, have data integrated in the, in the right ways so that you can analyze it and measure it properly. But data isn't, isn't everything you need. Mm -hmm. And I imagine naively, probably, that I'd show data to the right leaders and they'd say, we didn't realize that. Now that you showed us the data, we're going to change everything. And of course, that's laughable. It didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Even things like online scheduling. I would show a clinic lead, a clinic manager, or a, a medical group leader the data that how the slots were being used and how they're being scheduled online and how it's not optimized. And there's a lot of work to do. And the response was like, okay, well, I mean, it's complex. You don't know how it is. Craig, you're in marketing. You know, it's and this doc has unique needs, and, and this doc has a different patient data or patient uh, base than this doc. And so, yeah, you, you probably just don't get it. That was the reaction. I was flabbergasted. But it's, they're right in a way. Mm -hmm. That's why it's communications, really understanding the needs and frustrations and, and their stories. That's what makes the difference. So that's why I say that communication, I believe, is more important than anything else to start out. You need the data. Mm -hmm. But you got to start with the communication and then weave in the data and always focus on the what's in it for me. You know, it's the, it's the with them. Yeah, it sounds like we need the data and we also need the buy-in from the people that can act on the data. Right. And that's about relationships, which is about communication. <laughs> well, uh, I, I love where we've gone with this conversation. Imagine a lot of other people might love it too, and I just want to get in touch with Craig. I'm just curious, uh, what's the best way folks can reach out to you? I can only hope that people are interested enough to, to flood my inbox. That sounds super cool, but I'm not as cool as Chris Hemphill. But Ouch. if you do want to get in, in touch with me, um, C. Karchner at honorhealth.com is my email address. And I'm probably, I'm at Craig Karchner on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I'm probably even more active on LinkedIn. So reach out to me. It'd be great. Cool. Yeah, get in touch with Craig. Uh, we're excited to have been able to meet Craig in person and, and have this conversation. For those that, are, uh, that, that would like to have that conversation too and are focused on the consumer experience, feel free to reach out to him. And what we did this for is to bring you a little taste of HMPS. So we hope you've enjoyed the little slice that we've given you. 
If you want more of the latest from healthcare's thought leaders, subscribe using the button below, or you can visit hellohealthcare.com to get updates directly in your email.